our Heavenly Father. Lord God, Creator of Heaven and Earth, we come before you this morning, just as we are, and we ask that you would take us from where we are and take us somewhere different. Take us to where you are. I want to pray this morning for my friends and my family, my brothers and sisters, as we meet together today. Even though we are just humans and we make mistakes, I'd ask that you would forgive us, that you'd look past our past and help us to look forward to our future. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, not only our Creator, but our Saviour and our Redeemer. Amen. I feel this is a very important message this morning. I feel convicted to say that this is the most important sermon today that you'll ever hear. I don't say that because of the person speaking, but I say that because of the message. And I ask you this morning, I plead with you this morning to listen, because this is the most important message you'll hear in your life. I firmly believe that, and I believe that's from above. A question this morning that I think we need to answer together. Jesus of Nazareth, con artist or fair dinkum? I'm sorry, that's a bit of a flashing on the screen. We're doing our best. We've put the cable through twice, but uh, we're doing our best. Jesus of Nazareth, is he a con artist or is he fair dinkum? We need to get to the bottom of this because it has implications. Just a few years ago, before the beginning of the year 2000, I don't know if you happen to notice... But there were lots of people talking about the end of the world. We were um, worried about Y2K, we were worried about computer bugs, we were worried about computers crashing. I was in uh, college at the time as an aviation major, and as one of my assignments, I actually rang air traffic control in South Bend, Indiana, and I asked them to help me figure out for my special research paper what were the chances of air traffic control being suspended on Y2K, and they were honestly quite concerned about it. I have a paper I wrote on uh, Y2K for air traffic control in uh, South Bend. This magazine here, Time Magazine, was published at the uh, January 20, 1999, in the middle of all this hysteria. People worried about what's going to happen, is it going to be good news or bad news. Year 2000 came and went. I think some people even went out and bought extra food and candles and lanterns and stuff. I won't ask you to embarrass yourself if you did that too. But I, I just wanted to point out that that time came and it went. And afterwards people said, what was all the worry about? Nothing happened. And that's a fair question. Why worry about the end of the world if people keep on talking about it and it doesn't happen? Why should I worry about the end of the world? On Tuesday, early in the morning, before I woke up fully for the day, I had a dream. And I want to share with you what I saw in my dream. This, to the best of my reproduction, is exactly what I saw. And some of you will laugh, some of you will say, oh yeah, I've seen that before. And some of you will say, I know what he's talking about. Here is my dream. I was looking out in the backyard of my house. And I saw the moon and the stars, and I saw the hills, and they just gently dropped down below the horizon like that. That was my dream on Tuesday. And immediately I started to think, I wonder what this means. Some people attach meanings to dreams, some people dismiss it and write it off. And I was thinking, what shall I do with that dream? Shall I just dismiss it, or shall I write it off? Or shall I think about the verses in Matthew 24? As I saw those stars drop down there, I thought, I'd better just think for a minute and have a prayer and just see if there's anything significant to that dream. And that dream on Tuesday is the basis for my sermon today. Now, a few weeks ago, we had a sermon about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, for my friends that do not normally call themselves Christians, for my friends that don't normally read the Bible, don't really believe in that necessarily, it's very easy to think the resurrection of Jesus Christ is 
a theory. It's a fairy tale. It happened once upon a time in dreamland. We have no evidence for the resurrection. My skeptical friends, my atheist friends, they say, how do you know it happened? There's no evidence for that one. Well, we had a sermon a few weeks ago, and I hope that it was very clear, and I hope it was compelling, that there is very good, compelling, logical evidence for the fact of the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is not an assertion. That is based upon the best evidence we have. Now, I haven't got time to redo that sermon today. If you don't have confidence that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a literal, documented, trustworthy, historical account, we can go back at another time and do that sermon. But today, assuming that that is historical fact, and they've got good reasons to believe that, it isn't just me saying it. Atheist scholars and skeptics have come to find the same 12 facts that we struggle with, and they too begrudgingly have to confess that given the 12 theories out there, just two of those theories make sense, and both of those require a divine intervention. So I'll let you think about that one. So assuming today you believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a literal event, we've got some questions to answer. Number one, Jesus of Nazareth made some outlandish claims. Is that true? Did Jesus say some really strange things, some, out, some crazy things? I am God. I am going to come again. I'm going to rise from the dead. I am the king of the world. I'm going to judge you. <coughs> Jesus said these things. He said, for example, in Matthew 12, verse 40, that in three days he would rise from the dead. Did Jesus make that claim? Jesus made that claim. So if, if he made that claim, he's either crazy in the head, or he's delusional, or maybe it's true. I say it's true. And we had those reasons before because of um, our previous sermon. Jesus also claimed one day that he would judge the world. And that's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And this is our focus today. If you believe the resurrection is a historical event because Jesus claimed he would rise again and he did it, then if Jesus claimed to judge the world, he will do it. If you don't believe in the resurrection, we'll deal with that first. But if you believe in the resurrection, you're stuck with this next conclusion. Jesus claims he will one day judge the world. Now, here's a problem with, for us. These claims are either true or they're false. Either Jesus is lying to us, he's a con artist, or he's telling the truth and it's fair dinkum. And that's our job today to figure this out. As we discussed previously, the empty tomb and the post-mortem resurrection of Jesus have a historical probability so high as to be virtually certain, like the death of Caesar Augustus in AD 14 or the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. I didn't say that. That's uh, Professor N.T. Wright. He wrote an 800-page hardcover document on the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Gary Habermas, Dr. William Lane Craig, uh, Dr. Craig Hazen and multiple other apologists have convincingly shown us, based upon historical fact, based upon scholarly textual criticism, that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. And I'm happy to defend that uh, later date if required. Okay, so on the basis of that particular claim, at, therefore at least one of Jesus' crazy claims must be true. Jesus said he would rise from the dead in three days. We've got good evidence to suggest that it actually did happen. Now, this leads us to a question. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, and we say he did, then it seems quite likely that Jesus' claims come true. It must be that Jesus has a reason to say what he says. He's not just saying that for a bunch of hot air. He's not just saying that because he felt like it, or because he wanted to be some cool, super fancy dancy dude. He said these things because it was true, and he meant it. Now, for those that are sceptical and say, well, I'm not quite sure yet, you know, this is kind of, you know, amazing stuff. Maybe it's all made up. Maybe it's a fairy tale. Maybe, maybe Jesus won't really come again. Maybe it doesn't matter about the future because God's not going to come back and judge. So I ask another question. Has Jesus made any claim that can be falsified? Has Jesus made any claim that can be proven false? I'll let you answer that question. Give me just one example of anything Jesus said which we know is false. I'll ask any skeptic that question. Anything at all, Jesus said that we know is false. Pick one, if you can. Now, 
That leads us to a very difficult situation if we want to doubt. It's time to start thinking logically. It's time to reason together. If Jesus has in fact made a claim about his resurrection, which is indeed true, the asterisk there is because we've previously discussed that, and if none of Jesus' claims can be shown to be false, then what is the most logical conclusion regarding Jesus' claim to judge the world? He said, I'm going to rise from the dead. He's given us conclusive historical evidence that can be analysed that says, yes, indeed, he rose from the dead. We can't think of anything that Jesus has done which can be falsified. And then Jesus says he's going to come and judge the world. What's the most logical conclusion we need to come to? I'm not asking for faith, I'm asking for logic. Be a sceptic. What's the most logical conclusion based upon the evidence? It has to be true. Or at least it's a very good possibility it could be true. We can't write it off. All right. Jesus will judge this world. He says he will, and we've got good reason to believe it. Okay, now that leads us to another question. If Jesus will judge this world, is that good news or bad news? It's a trick question. If Jesus is coming, if Jesus really is coming back to judge this world, and we need to figure out if this is good news or bad news, because it does make a difference. Because right <laughs> so Betty says, and there's a picture of a judge up there, Betty says if you're on the right side of the law, the hammer's going to fall down on the right side of the, is it the gable when the hammer comes down. Mm-hmm. When the hammer comes down, if you're on the good side of the law, it's good news. Mm-hmm. But pity you if you're on the wrong side of the law. It's bad news for those who think that they're on the right, right side. I'm glad Tony pointed that out. I'm going, to just, I'm going to just come to that right now. Okay, so, if you have your Bibles with you, please come with me to Matthew 25, verses 35 to 45. Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 45. <coughs> There's a story here, and this is, by the way, in my Bible, it's Jesus talking. This is this guy that's either a con artist or he's fair dinkum. He's one or the other. He cannot be both. Jesus is telling us here that one day he's coming back and he, he pictures himself as someone who is separating the sheep from the goats. And he says there, verse 34... Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I reckon that's good news for those people on his right hand side, wouldn't you? Alright. And of course, I don't want to focus on it too much, but I have to tell the truth. Verse 41 also applies. We can't just pick the nice parts of the Bible and throw away the bad parts. They all have to come together. Verse 41, what does verse 41 say? Matthew 25, verse 41. The king will say to those on his left, Go away from me. You will be punished. Go into the fire that burns forever. That has that was prepared for the dead in any danger. Okay. So there's two groups of people. We have, and Tony, I really like the way Tony brought it out. There's two groups of people. The first think they are good enough, but are charged as guilty. Remember in verse in uh, chapter 25 there, Jesus says, "Depart from me," and they say, "But Lord, Lord, you know we were good people. We came to church. We wore fancy clothes. We paid our tithes. I told everybody on Facebook that I love the Lord." <laughs> and Jesus says, "What?" He says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, your wickedness. Why would God pick upon people that claim to be Christians as being wicked? That's a bit embarrassing, by the way, for us that claim to go to church. So be very careful if you claim to go to church and be a Christian. All right. 
Now, the second group of people, as Tony was pointing out, they think they are no good, but what happens? The judge makes their judgment and they're surprised because they got the wrong verdict. They are supposed to be feeling bad about themselves, but they are actually judged to be righteous. Maybe this is an upside-down picture of the kingdom of heaven. Why is it that the people that think they're innocent are actually guilty? And why is it that the people that think they're guilty are actually innocent? That's a really good thing to think about. I think, as uh, Tony just pointed out, that there are two groups of people. We are in one of those two groups. And we've got to be very careful if we think we're in the first group. Do you think you are good enough? And I'll just, I'll just wind up the message. And I appeal to you this morning, particularly my brothers and sisters, that claim that you are Christians. I claim that I'm Christians, I'm in this group too. I've got to be careful about this. Do I think I'm good enough? Do you think you're good enough? Some of my mates who aren't even believers say, well, I think I'm a pretty good guy. I don't kill anybody. I'm generous with my money. I give to people that need it. I'm a, basically a good guy. I never killed anybody. Um, I don't speed too often. Um, I'm, a, I'm a good person. Just ask me. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. So if you think you're good enough, if you think you, you are all set, if you have no concern for the future, you say, it doesn't matter, I'm on a good path, I've got it all sorted out. You look at me wearing a tie and think, oh, Nate, he thinks he's good enough. Here's the warning. This is the warning for those that think they're good enough. There's a few words there, I'm sorry, but it's worth reading. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 20. This is what it says. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. Who is excluded there? Is anybody left out? That seems to apply to everybody. I don't do that one, Lord. I'm, I'm, I seek after you, Lord. I, I'm a nice person. I, I pay money to charities and I do all the right things. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. I don't murder, supposedly. Destruction and misery always follows them. They don't know where to find peace. Isn't that the truth? They have no fear, I should say, we have no fear of God at all. And Paul makes a comment here, Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply does what? The law simply shows us how bad we really are. All right? So I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but do you think you're good enough? I met a lady, uh, I was uh, on a flight with her, we had a chat up in, uh, I think it was Udadada from memory, a few months ago, and she's a non-Christian, and she said to me, I think I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. And I said, oh really? Well, that's wonderful. Great to hear it. I asked, I said, may I ask you a question? I said, are you absolutely perfect? And she said, well, I'm pretty good. I said, have you ever made a mistake in your entire life? Well, yeah, a couple. I said, does that mean you're good enough? Well, yeah, I'm not too bad. And I explained to her that there is a standard for being good enough. In order to be good enough, according to the Bible, we have to be absolutely perfect. Any blemish anywhere, and that's not good enough. None of us, I don't believe, meet that standard. No pastor, no priest, nobody, not even, I should say myself especially, <laughs> None of us meet the standards. None of us are good enough. If you think you're good enough, we're in big trouble. Yeah, Nate, there's something else to consider as well. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. So we can't see what's inside of the person. That's, that's we right. We can judge from the outside and think that people are doing the wrong thing. 
that's that's pretty scary stuff. Yeah. God's looking at our hearts, not not on the outside. And uh, people on the outside say, "Oh, look, this person looks all right." But Jesus said, "You whitewashed tombs, your sepulchres, you sepulchres, your your con artists. It's it's us humans that are the con artists, not Jesus." Okay. Here's another another part of the. Do you think you're good enough crowd? Here's a cartoon here. And there's a, there's a Pharisee, we kind of pick on the Pharisees a lot, we've got to be careful about that because if we're not careful, we too can be Pharisees. But this guy says, I praise God that I am not like some other guy. In this case, he says a tax collector. I won't make it too personal because I'll get in trouble and so forth. But be very careful when you hear people say, I'm so wonderfully grateful that I'm not like so and so. I'm much better than him or her. I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm a clean person. I don't swear. I don't... Fill in the blank. What does Jesus say about that? Well, there's a story in Mark 10, verses 17 to 27, the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler was the perfect Seventh-day Adventist. He kept the Sabbath. He tithed. He put in a second tithe, probably even a third tithe. He was generous. He didn't break any of the commandments from childhood till now. And what did Jesus conclude about the... uh, the rich young ruler, Mark 10, 17 to 27. After all of these wonderful things that this rich young ruler had done, what was Jesus' uh, prognosis? What was the uh, conclusion? What was the outlook for this poor ruler? This wonderfully perfect guy. Think about verse 25. Here we go. Jesus says, Mark chapter 10, verse 25, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Is God picking on rich people here? I think God's picking on Adventists here. He's picking on the rich young ruler, not because he's rich, but because he's part of the group that thinks he's good enough. It's not money itself which is the problem, it's the love of money. That's the problem. It's, it's putting God after my other things. That was his problem. If you still think you're good enough, don't forget that there's a penalty for absolute, oh, for being just shy of absolute perfection. 99.999 on your, on your final exam, the judgment, is still a fail. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God's eternal life. But that's only through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin remain death. If you think you're good enough, I think we need to be on our knees. All right, now there's a second group of people. The other side of the coin. Some of us are very fearful. We're, we're nervous. I've got several people in my own family that say, oh my goodness, I can never be good enough. I can never get to heaven. I can never earn salvation. I can never meet it because I just don't have what it takes. I'm not good enough. How do we figure out the destiny, or if we are in that group of people that are thinking positive, how can we get some encouragement? I'd like to suggest Luke chapter 19, verses 7 to 10. This is the story of Zacchaeus. And in the story of Zacchaeus, a whole bunch of people that went to church, they thought Zacchaeus was a sinner. And they probably were right. Zacchaeus probably was a real rotten scoundrel. And Zacchaeus came to came to the point in his life where he said, "Rats! I just figured out that I'm a really rotten person, and I don't want to be this way. I I want to have a different life. I want to turn around. If you think you're too bad, then it's time to join the party with uh, Zacchaeus. This is what Zacchaeus did. Well, this is a story. The people that's the that's the Christians like you and me were very unhappy. They said, Zacchaeus has gone to be." Well, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Who's the notorious sinner? That's Zacchaeus. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Had Zacchaeus been cheating? Absolutely. Why do you think he was rich? Because he was a cheater. Jesus responded what? What did Jesus say to Zacchaeus? Thank you. Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save who? The people that think they're good enough? No. The people that are lost. The story of the prodigal son, Christopher and Joanne and some others of us, we were talking about the prodigal son a few weeks ago. Jesus is looking for the lost boy. Jesus is looking for the lost girl. Jesus isn't looking for the good enough because they're already lost. Jesus is looking for those that have finally realized they're lost and they want to go in a different direction. <coughs> Do you still think you are too bad? Here's a wonderful promise. For God so loved the world, or God loved the world so much, that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in what, or believes in who. If we believe in God, there is no judgment. But everyone who does not believe in God has been judged for not believing in God, one and only Son. Okay, so here we've got the, we're just winding up to a conclusion now. Here's a fact. Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. I challenge anybody to provide any credible evidence to the contrary. It's a proven fact. It is, it is reasonable beyond, beyond reasonable doubt. It's a literal, historical, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus said, not only will I rise from the dead, but I will come back and I will judge. And each one of us are in one of those two groups. Maybe you're in the group that says, I'm good enough. Or it's not going to happen. Or it doesn't matter. It's all good, yo. It's all, it's all sweet as. But those are the people to be worried. And the other people that are nervous, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I'm kind of worried about all the signs, the time of trouble. I was confiding this dream with one of my colleagues at work this week. And he said, that's kind of scary. What a nightmare. And I wanted to say, you know what? It's only a nightmare if you're not ready. <laughs> it's good news. Jesus coming back is good news if we think we're not good enough. But there's more than just thinking we're not good enough. Just thinking you're not good enough does not in and of itself mean good news. It's a good start. But I wanted to share with you, in closing, my final petition with you this morning. I'm asking you to listen. This is Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7. These are not my words. These are the words of the first angel that flies in the midst of the heaven. This angel, I believe, is flying in the midst of the heaven at this very moment. It's a symbolic image, but it is telling us that God has a message. This is what the angel says. And I saw another angel, it's the first angel, flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. What's the message of the first angel? Fear God, he shouted, give glory to him, for the time has come when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So if you think you're good enough, you're in big trouble. If you think you're no good, you're not good enough, the angel says, it's time to recognize your creator. It's time to recognize him who made the heaven and the earth. When it uses the word fear there, it doesn't mean go in a corner and quake in your boots. Fear means it's time to show respect where respect is due. It's time to show honor and reverence and humility where honor, reverence, and humility are due. God says, or well, the angel says, worship God because he has created the heaven and the earth. You are in one of those two groups this morning. You and me, we are either the first group that says, we're pretty right, thanks, mate. Don't, don't trouble me with all this uh, doom and gloom stuff. You know, that Time magazine, all that um, doom and worry and fretting about the future. It's all sweet. Just, just drop it. I don't want to worry about that stuff. I say, look out. God rose from the dead. He will judge. But... If we are nervous, if we are concerned, if we say, well, I don't know if I'm ready, I'm not good enough, I'm concerned that I have made mistakes in my life, then Jesus has come to seek and to save those kinds of people. I hope that I'm in the second group. I know that I'm in the second group as long as I am humble and on my knees. And I ask you this morning, if you want to be in the humble group, 
If you want to be in the group that says, we're not good enough, but we want to be good enough, I encourage you to get down on your knees. I'm going to pray right now for God to draw us close to Him. If you're confident, if you've got it all sorted out, and you say, no thanks, I plead with you. I plead with you as my brothers and sisters to look at the evidence. Look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It did happen. It's documented. If Jesus promised that, what makes you think He won't come back? What makes you think only some of His outlandish promises come true? What gives you that kind of faith? Take the evidence. I say this to your knees and uh, trust God. Please, if you want to put yourself in the second group, on your knees, let's pray and ask God to help us. Our Heavenly Father, we think of the story in Matthew 10 and 25 of the sheep and the goats. The goats on your left hand that said, we're good people. We have it all sorted out. We've done the right things. And Lord, on the other side is the, is the sheep. The ones that don't know for sure, that have been through difficult times, who have made mistakes. And I pray, Lord, that you'd find us in the second group with the sheep on your right hand side. Lord, we don't know everything. We don't have all the answers. But we humbly kneel down before you because we know that you will come back. If you rose from the dead according to your uh, prediction, your promise, then we have good reason to believe that your other claims are also true. We believe that you said that you would come back, not just because it was a good story, but because it was the honest truth. And we ask that you would uh, prepare our hearts this morning. I pray for my brothers and sisters and myself, as we kneel before you this morning, that you would cleanse our hearts, make us right, Give us confidence and peace in the future. And please help us to reach out to our brothers and sisters, to our friends, our colleagues, who do not yet realise that they are in the wrong group. Please help us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.